All right, everyone, we will get started in just about five minutes or so. I am super excited, super pumped. And uh, if you are just logging in, please read the instructions on the screen. I am so excited to get to know each and every one of you. And thank you so much for joining me today. All right. Good morning, everyone. I just wanted to ask if you don't mind, please put in the chat box if you can see me and you can hear me. I also want to know if you can see my slides transition in front of you on your screen as well. Yes to all three? Go ahead and put that in the chat. All right. We have some people saying yes. Thank you so much for doing that audiovisual check for me. I really appreciate it. We're going to get started in just about five minutes. And now we have a super high influx of people coming in. Welcome, welcome, everybody. If you are just logging in to this classroom and this session, please open up your chat and say hello and where you are logging in from. I would absolutely love to know where you are logging in from because I mean, in these past few webinars, we have had an international audience. That is just phenomenal. All right, we have Sana from Michigan, Ross from my alma mater, Neomed, that is great. All right, Glenn, familiar name from the Philippines. Welcome back, Glenn. We have a jam-packed classroom. That is awesome. Khadija from Florida. Anna from Neomed. Thank you so much for joining. All right. Mother from DC. Hello. This is absolutely awesome. We're gonna get started in just about three to four minutes. Make sure you have your coffee as well as your chat box open. Uh, this one hour session is going to be jam packed and I'm gonna bring that energy, but it's a bi-directional relationship. So please stay focused. This is not supposed to be some background noise. I want you to actively participate because this webinar is full Full of questions, my friends. All right, Frishta from Virginia. That's not too far from DC. That's great. And remember, if you are just joining us right now, we are having so many people come into the classroom. I'm so excited. Please go ahead, open your chat. Say hello, where you're logging in from. All right. Shraddha from India. We have Marie from New York. Welcome. Great. Praveen, thanks so much for joining from India. That's awesome. Laura, what's up? Maya coming in from Northeast Ohio, my old stomping grounds. That is absolutely awesome. And I know we have... One person who said, I cannot see your screen. Uh, everybody else, uh, is, that, is that true? Can you all see my screen, yes or no? Okay, great. Awesome. 
Awesome. Thank you so much for that feedback. That is absolutely awesome. Molly, hello. Hope you're doing well. Marielle, Laura, Mazen, Amrita. Excellent. Awesome. Atulia, thanks so much for that uh, wonderful audio visual check. I think it's just so important and I'm a one man show. So I'm audio support and I am also giving the lecture, but it's all good. Life is awesome. All right. It's a big classroom today, guys. This is great. Shout out Neomed. That's right. All right. I'm just going to give a one or two more minutes. We have the classroom exploding right now with people logging in. So thank you all for being so timely. That is absolutely phenomenal. And hey, if you're just logging in, please open your chat, say hello, where you're logging in from. I'd love to get to know every single one of you. This class is going to be around an hour, hour and 15 minutes. All right. We have someone from Tennessee down south. We have Ohio. That is great. OH. <laughs> All right. Tammy from Maryland. We have a lot of people from Rootstown, Ohio. Thank you all for joining Neomed, my old stomping grounds. That is great. All right. Well, guys, it is exactly 10 a.m. And I want to be very respectful to all of yours time. And I just want to give a little bit of an introduction and let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I first off want to thank each and every one of you for joining. Please keep the chat box going in this hour session. And I would really encourage each and every one of you right now to just put away all of your distractions. You don't need your phone right now. You don't need any other uh, device in front of you. I want to really encourage you to just focus with me for the next hour, hour and 15 minutes, so that you can really gain some high yield, integrative, application-based content covering gastroenterology. Ladies and gentlemen, I wanna start with a little bit of an introduction. First off, if you already have been to my webinars, I welcome you back. And if you are new, my name is Rahul. I'm currently doing my pediatric critical care fellowship. And over the past six years, I have been absolutely passionate about helping students just like you excel and prepare for the USMLE exam. I am so, so passionate about helping you succeed and learn this content, not only for the three-digit score, but to really help patients in the future. Now, I know that there's so much out there already, but I want to just give you a brief glimpse as to why I think this project, Hi Guru, is so unique. First off, I based my whole curriculum and my whole methodology of preparation on the evidence in the medical education sphere. I focus all of my lectures on active recall, and so today is going to be like a guided Anki deck. It's going to be like doing question bank and content at the same time. You'll also see a lot of integration. This is not just going to be GI, ladies and gentlemen. We are going to have GI, little bit of endocrine. We're going to be talking about biochemistry, embryology, integrating across organ systems and domains. And I am going to be giving you test-taking strategies how to approach questions so that when you in an exam scenario get really tense and anxious, you will understand and know how to apply different strategies so that you can eventually get to the correct answer. I have been preparing students for thousands and thousands of hours. And what I've really based my program on are three things, the triad, content, application and test-taking strategy, a sound test-taking psychology, so you stay positive and upbeat as you prepare and go into your exam, and finally, scheduling for success. 
I encourage you to really hone in on three, these three domains, whether you're an M1 in medical school right now, or you're just gearing up for your USMLE exam, I would really encourage you to make sure that you don't just master the content, but you learn how to apply the content. You stay organized in your process and you don't get down on yourself. Remember, everybody focuses on that three-digit score and the outcome, but man, you will serve yourself so well, if you just focus on the process, how can you be a little bit better than you were yesterday? Most importantly, I think what makes HiGuru so absolutely unique is the fact that we are a community. I have been absolutely blessed to prepare students at top medical schools, holding live classes, integrating the USMLE material into the medical school curriculum. And it's been absolutely awesome to connect with students personally. Now we've transitioned to a global community of learners in medicine, and we have over 250 people live streaming this right now. I would encourage you to really keep your chat box open and keep typing answers into the chat box. Make sure that you're staying engaged and actually learning something from this webinar. Because at the end, I'm going to give you or ask you to type something that you have learned into the chat box. So please stick around till the end. And again, take out all of those distractions. I promise you this one hour is going to be so worth it. So what inspired me to create this webinar a few months back, there was a Reddit post that really captured the most recurring concepts from the NBME practice exams. I have synthesized that and created this lecture based on that content outline. And on my website for absolutely free, you can go ahead and get the whole list of content specs that is related to that outline. Today, we are going to be covering GI. And most importantly, I have my cardiology one, which we started with, as well as my endocrine one posted. You can watch it on YouTube or what I did just as an extra value point. If you go to highguru.com and under free resources, you go under golden style course, you will see the top concepts broken up into small little videos so that you can go through the course in a structured way and check off the various content types. Guys, I wanna provide you value. And this is a two-way street. You will get out what you put in. So stay engaged with me. And without further ado, go ahead in the chat. If you are ready to get started, go ahead and type in yes into the chat box. All right. Wonderful. Wow. This is absolutely awesome. Let's go ahead and get started. So guys, today I have broken up the webinar into two big buckets. And first, what we're going to do is we're going to go to gas through gastroenterology, and then we're going to be covering hepatology. In gastroenterology, we're going to start with esophageal issues. And in particular, we're going to be talking about the test taking strategy to your dysphagia questions on the NBME or USMLE. We're going to be talking about some esophageal pathologies. We're going to go into a little bit of GI physiology and then subsequently transition on how I approach the test taking strategy behind abdominal pain. We're then going to pivot and we're going to hit up a little bit of embryology and we're going to close gastroenterology with some inflammatory disorders. Now, this will be a great segue into some hepatology concepts, most specifically bile acid metabolism, covering a little bit of biochemistry, some infectious disease with hepatitis B and vesicular steatosis. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you all to keep that chat box going. I'm going to be flashing a lot of questions. If you go ahead and type it out, I promise you it's going to stick in your mind. All right. Without any further ado, let's go ahead and talk about esophageal issues. All right. So the first thing that we are going to be talking about is how I go through dysphagia on the USMLE. Now, remember, dysphagia is going to be difficulty swallowing. 
And so on in exam questions, I'm going to stratify in my mind whether or not the patient has progressive dysphagia or sin dysphagia. So what's progressive dysphagia? Well, progressive dysphagia is when in the exam question, they will say the patient first had issues with eating solid foods. And then a few months later, that progressed to not being able to tolerate liquids. And in this case, the USMLE and NBME are going for an obstructive pathology, something that is actually obstructing the esophageal tube, like a cancer. That is going to be different from syn dysphagia. When you talk about syn dysphagia, that is actually having issues with solids and liquids at the same time. And so in my mind, that means that there is a peristalsis issue. And remember, in order to get solids and liquids down, you need to have good peristalsis of the esophagus such that the esophagus can empty the food into the stomach. And so that's why I say when you see syn dysphagia, think about achalasia, which is going to be a motility issue. Achalasia is going to be a pathology in which the lower esophageal sphincter is unable to relax. And let's go into these questions a little bit more. So first NVME style question, we have a 56 year old man who presents with weight loss, cough and diffuse chest pain. He has been having difficulty swallowing for one month. He is unable to drink or tolerate solid foods. Manometry shows increased lower esophageal sphincter pressures and the high LES pressure is consistent even after swallowing food. A radiologic study in this patient would most likely be consistent with which of the following findings. So key concepts from this, he can't tolerate liquids and solids, and he has high lower esophageal sphincter. What do you all think would be the answer here? And whoa, the chat box is going nuts. You're absolutely correct. Birds beak appearance. Real quick. So double bubble, that's going to be duodenal atresia. Remember, that's going to present in a neonate with bilious hemesis. Obstructive tumor, that would be if the patient had progressive dysphagia. Microcolon on abdominal x-ray, that is going to be more consistent with me uh, meconium ileus. And then upper esophageal stricture in the esophagus on barium swallow. Again, it's this is not an obstructive pathology as much as it is a high lower esophageal sphincter tone, and that is achalasia. So when it comes to achalasia, you see the bird's beak appearance, how the lower esophageal area is going to narrow. And this could be a common question, uh, a common question on your exam, and that is actually interpreting manometry. So the key point here is that at the lower esophageal sphincter, you still have a very high pressure and there are no peristaltic waves. After you swallow the food bolus, there's no peristaltic waves. And so that lack of peristaltic waves, as well as the high LES sphincter tone that you can see on manometry, that could be a way the USMLE could tackle this pathology. Ladies and gentlemen, it's all about thinking like the test maker. All right. Let's go in and pivot to our Mallory Weiss versus Borhoff syndrome. When we look at this pathology, let's start with this question. A slender female comes in with painful coffee ground emesis. Examination of the vomitus is consistent with occult blood positivity. When it's coffee ground, that means that the stomach as well as the blood is essentially mixing together. So this patient is having a lot of vomiting and what metabolic abnormality may this patient develop? And you are absolutely correct. If you said metabolic alkalosis, ladies and gentlemen, when you are vomiting, you are going to be vomiting of hydrochloric acid. And so you will get the metabolic alkalosis. This coffee ground emesis is very consistent with a Mallory Weiss here. And so let's go into the pathophysiology. Remember, when you are going to have recurrent vomiting, you're going to have increased intra-abdominal pressures, and that is going to cause linear lacerations where? At the gastroesophageal junction. So a Mallory Weiss tear is just that little bit of a tear in the blood vessels, and you see the blood in the vomitus. Now, 
if this patient continued to have vomiting and now has air under the clavicle region and you feel the crepitus, what's going to be the diagnosis? Well, then it's going to be your Borhoff syndrome. And so Borhoff syndrome are these micro perforations in the esophagus because you just keep vomiting and the tissue tears and you get this subcutaneous emphysema. The areas in red is where I would, if nothing else, focus in on. All right, stay active and engaged. Again, guided Anki deck and doing questions and content at the same time, you are learning a lot. So this image is going to summarize some acid-based stuff. If you are vomiting recurrently, you're going to have a metabolic alkalosis. Let's go ahead and build on that a little bit. That means that your pH is going to be high and your bicarb is also going to be high. If you are going to have diarrhea, diarrhea itself is going to be a highly potassium-rich alkaline fluid. So if you're losing an alkaline fluid, you will have with diarrhea, usually a non-anion gap metabolic acidosis. And remember, a metabolic acidosis is defined by acidosis, low pH, and if it's metabolic, you're going to have a low bicarb. Please burn this image into your mind. It will give you, get you a lot of points. When you're talking about the next concept, which we talked about was Borhoff syndrome, you got to notice that air in the mediastinum. And so the T is where the trachea is. Remember, the esophagus is going to be a retroperitoneal organ. And look right near the esophagus, as well as near the aortic arch, you are going to see that air. And on physical exam, it's going to manifest as crepitus. All right. Next concept that we are going to be going through is Barrett's esophagus. The USMLE loves Barrett's esophagus. Why? Because it is the opportunity for your NBME questions to integrate histology into a pathology. Barrett's esophagus, let's go ahead and get started with our question. So we have an obese male with this eight week history of asthma-like symptoms comes in with intermittent squeezing chest pain. Now, ladies and gentlemen, remember when you see chest pain, I know this is the GI type of uh, webinar, you may think angina, but especially if you see this at night, this is gonna be more likely GERD. So what pathological term is used to describe the histological change this patient may have on endoscopy and biopsy of the lower esophageal region? So recurrent GERD can cause you to have metaplasia. And I want you to know, and Pathoma does a great job highlighting this, that metaplasia is reversible. So if you treat the GERD, you can actually not have a progression to dysplasia. So the tissue that is going to um, uh, be seen on your biopsy is going to be this change between a non-keratinized squamous epithelium, which is the normal lower esophageal tissue, and it is going to be overtaken, i.e. there's gonna be metaplasia to a simple columnar epithelium with goblet cells. And essentially that is going to be the gastric tissue. So as you note, the lower esophageal area gets taken over by gastric tissue and that's metaplasia. Barrett's esophagus is a precursor lesion to esophageal adenocarcinoma, and the mechanism is this progression from a metaplasia to a dysplasia and carcinoma sequence. This is a common theme that you will see not only in GI, but when you go into repro, you will see that same metaplasia dysplasia sequence. You may also see a hyperplasia dysplasia sequence as well. So as you note, the lower esophageal sphincter area, that is typically going to have a non-keratinized squamous epithelium. And if that is overtaken, that squamal columnar junction, if that is overtaken by the columnar cells with goblet, uh, uh, with goblet cells as well, you are going to be thinking of recurrent GERD affecting that region. And just to kind of draw a parallel. Remember, GERD is a decrease in lower esophageal sphincter tone. What did we talk about before, guys? Achalasia. 
And that's an increase in lower esophageal sphincter tone. Do you see how I'm drawing that compare and contrast? All right, very good. We're gonna be talking about some precursor lesions that are very high yield for the USMLA. So this is the integration now. Adenocarcinoma, you are going to be thinking of some precursor lesions to adenocarcinoma. Barrett's esophagus, we've talked about that. Endometrial hyperplasia, this is what I alluded to in the repro module. You are going to be thinking of the hyperplasia being due to the high amount of estrogen that is going to kind of make the proliferation of the spiral arteries. H. pylori can lead you to adenocarcinoma as well as DES exposure. And that could lead to vaginal adenosis as well as clear cell adenocarcinoma of the vagina. Now, squamous cell cancers, I like to think about a lot of irritation. And so things like achalasia could give you squamous cell carcinoma of the esophagus. Smoking can give you squamous cell carcinoma of the esophagus as well as the larynx and alcohol as well. Again, chronic irritation is the name of the game when it comes to squamous cell carcinomas. And what do you need to look out for in histology? Keratin pearls and intercellular bridges. Actinic keratosis is a dermatological tie-in here. Remember that actinic keratosis is a scaly lesion in sun-exposed areas, and that could be a precursor to squamous cell carcinoma of the skin. So anytime you see a precursor lesion, you need to know that for your exams. Why? Because the USMLE for both step one and step two, they like to say, if you recognize this precursor lesion and intervene, you can actually progress or prevent cancer. All right, now we're going to go into acid secretion in the GI system. What's gonna be very important for you to note is that all of the action is happening at the parietal cell. However, there are different hormones that are hitting that parietal cell. The first thing that we will do is just integrate a little bit of the normal physiology. And that is the fact that acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter that is classically associated with your parasympathetic nervous system. And acetylcholine, back from even your MCAT days, you know that that is rest and digest. So that's going to increase acid secretion. What else is going to increase acid secretion? Well, you are going to have increased acid secretion with histamine as well. Histamine is going to be secreted from the enterochromaffin-like cells. And that is going to then hit the H2 receptor within the gut. Remember, H2 receptor is within the gut. H1 is in the nose. So any questions related to allergies, you're going to be thinking about H1. Whereas any question related to GERD or acid production, you're going to be thinking of H2. The other important trigger is going to be gastrin. And gastrin is going to be a very pro-digestion within the stomach. The other element to keep in mind is that with all of these triggers, you are going to get stimulation of the H and K ATPase at the luminal surface of your parietal cell. And the USMLE and NBME love to test that this is an example of primary active transport. I can't stress that enough because it uses ATP. If we delve into this a little bit deeper, I want to turn your attention to the areas highlighted in the red rectangles. We see that gastrin works via a GQ, G protein coupled receptor pathway. We see that acetylcholine does the same thing and that's related to the M3 receptor. Ladies and gentlemen, you got to know that autonomic pharmacology. And if you have not mastered that just yet, it's totally fine. I have a video in my free course that goes through autonomic pharmacology. I would highly recommend you checking that out. Another important trigger that I didn't put in the red rectangle, but I think is a little bit important is calcium. If you have hypercalcemia, ladies and gentlemen, you can actually get increased acid secretion. And that ties in really well with that GQ pathway because GQ is all about increased intracellular calcium. Histamine, we talked about that being a trigger for acid secretion, but let's make that knowledge a little bit deeper. And let's say that histamine is going to activate the GS pathway. So H2 agonism activates the GS pathway. Somatostatin, 
as well as prostaglandins are going to decrease acid production. Remember, prostaglandins, they are going to actually increase what? Mucus secretion from the goblet cells. And that's important for you all to recognize. Why? Because the USMLE is going to just attack you with this question on NSAIDs. Remember, NSAIDs like ibuprofen, celecoxib, all of your NSAIDs, ketorolac, are going to affect the arachidonic acid pathway by inhibiting COX. You're going to get downstream less prostaglandins. If you get less prostaglandins, let's focus that discussion into the gastroenterology system. If you have less prostaglandins, you're going to have less mucus secretion. If you have less mucus secretion, how does that relate to normal histology? You don't have a good barrier to protect yourself from acid secretion. Less mucus, increase susceptibility to high acid, and thus you will form ulcers or have gastritis. NSAIDs affect the gut in that way. Remember, NSAIDs are also going to affect your levels of thromboxin A2. And from a hematology standpoint, remember less thromboxin A2, less platelet aggregation. And finally, if you are going to take NSAIDs, you are going to also affect the tone of the afferent arterial. Why? Afferent arterial is going to be mediated by prostaglandin activity. You take NSAIDs, low prostaglandins, you get vasoconstriction of the afferent arterial, and that's why your creatinine goes up. Ladies and gentlemen, NSAIDs, let's summarize the stomach, the kidney, as well as the platelets. If you're learning something, go ahead and type in yes into the chat box. Is this good? Yes, no, maybe so? Awesome. I know you guys are paying attention. I absolutely love this. Thank you all for staying active and engaged. So let's go ahead and tie in a little bit of farm. And when we're thinking about pharmacology, remember that Zantac, which is ranitidine, ranitidine is going to be an H2 receptor blocker. So what is it going to do? It's going to modulate the GS pathway. The other important and uh, pharmacological agent is going to be omeprazole. Anything prazol is going to directly inhibit HK ATPA. So how do examiners like to go for this? They like to say that omeprazole inhibits primary active transport. That's very important. All right. Very good. Let's go ahead and answer this question together. A 38-year-old male patient with a duodenal ulcer is treated successfully on cimetidine. Which of the following mechanisms best describes the agent started in this patient? A, blocks muscarinic receptors on parietal cells. B, blocks GQ receptors on parietal cells. C, decreases intracellular cyclic AMP levels. D, it activates primary active transport. Or E, enhances acetylcholine action. What do you all think? All right, we have a lot of answers here and you're absolutely correct because remember, H2 blockade is going to downregulate your cyclic AMP in the parietal cells. Just another integration here. Remember, parietal cells are not only important for acid, but parietal cells are also important for, wha-bam, intrinsic factor. And that's important for B12 metabolism. Whoops, there's gonna be a question coming up soon. All right, so... This is where I'm going to really provide you a lot of value. And that is how I approach pharmacology. Now, I know many of you are using resources which use pictures and some silly mnemonics, but I want you to consider studying pharmacology like this. And that is first starting with the pathology or pathophysiology, just like I said, increase acid production. Then what I want you to do is have a reverse pyramid approach. Pay attention to this. What you'll first do is try to integrate the pathology and pathophysiology to the class effect of the pharmacological agents, i.e. what's the big picture? Then after you say, okay, this is the pathology, high acid, and the big picture is that I want to decrease the amount of acid then you can go into the specific mechanism of action, still keeping in mind the pathophysiology of the disease. After that, what you will do is you will get the specific names of the medications put into your mind. You've gotten the big picture. You've gone through the mechanism of action. Now, 
you have built the foundation to put those small little details. What are the specific names? This is where your mnemonics may be helpful. And then finally, after you've gone through the specific names, then integrate the side effects. Because then what you'll be able to do is link some of the side effects to the actual specific names of the medication. Let's go through an example. High amount of acid. We talked about GERD, for example. And the big picture is that we want to decrease acid production. Subsequently, we are going to employ the H2 receptor blockers, for example. And H2 receptor blockers block H2 and decrease cyclic AMP or the GS activity. The specific names are going to be typically the iodines. So cimetidine, ranitidine, and the important side effect is going to be, especially for cimetidine, SIP inhibition. So it could increase the concentration of other medications as well as gynecomastia because it's an anti-androgenic medication. What's another anti-androgenic medication that's high yield? Hit them up with that spironolactone life. Spironolactone, cimetidine, these are agents that have an anti-androgenic effect. Please understand that um, for your exams. All right, let's go ahead and go into this question. The following pairs of hormones are related to parietal cell secretion. Which of the following pairs most correlate to the gastrointestinal physiology of parietal cells? Go ahead and take a look at the answer choices and let me know what you think. All right, we have a lot of A and you're absolutely correct that parietal cells have a dual function. Not only are you gonna have acid secretion, but you're going to have intrinsic factor being secreted and intrinsic factor is really important for B12 metabolism. I can't stress that enough. All right, the next portion of this, we're going to be talking about how I approach abdominal pain on the USMLE. And what I like to do is in my exam questions, I like to look at where the abdominal pain actually is occurring. You have to hone in on that sentence, the physical exam, especially because they'll say, oh, it's in the right upper quadrant, the right lower quadrant, et cetera, et cetera. And so as you localize that abdominal pain, I want you to then take it a next step further and be like, hmm, so what is in that region? See, I'm teaching you how to think. And so when we think about the right upper quadrant, obviously, yes, liver and gallbladder is there. So what are the exam questions that they can ask you? Well, cholecystitis in which you have a tender gallbladder and maybe some jaundice. Cholelithiasis, remember female fat 40 in which you are going to have that gallstone. Hepatomegaly, maybe this is some sort of, here we go, right heart failure in which the blood is backing from the right ventricle, right atrium, and then into your liver. And then remember that that right upper quadrant can give you referred pain to the shoulder as well. Let's transition to the epigastric region. And in the epigastric region, you have the pancreas. So if they say that there's nausea and epigastric pain, think about pancreatitis. Or if there's epigastric pain that's radiating to the back, maybe you have a aortic aneurysm or a triple A or a dissection. Remember, who are patients that are going to get the triple A dissection? Well, those are going to be patients who maybe have Marfan syndrome. Remember, Marfan syndrome is going to be a defect in fibrillin, so you don't have good elastin, or you're going to have the patient who is going to have atherosclerotic risk factors. What about the left upper quadrant? The left upper quadrant is where the spleen is. And so left upper quadrant issues, not only are you going to be thinking about, hey, I got into a car accident, that type of question. And now I have hypovolemic shock because remember the spleen on the left side of your body has a high amount of red blood cells. The other USMLA question, guys, you got to still keep paying attention to my words because man, you got to make those notes. This is all going to be on your exams. The patient who has mononucleosis, hit them up with that EBV. You have a big, 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 big spleen in EBV. That's why we advise patients to not play contact sports. What are other elements of splenic pathology that you got to keep in mind? Well, the person who is asplenic because of trauma or sickle cell, and they got a spleen resection. And what's the microbiology tie-in? Encapsulated organisms. So watch out for your strep pneumo bacteremia that could occur. 
Now, when I think about flank pain, flank pain is going to be related to pyelonephritis or kidney stone. And when I think about the pyelonephritis, it's going to be fever plus CVA tenderness and costal vertebral angle. That's it near your flank. Fever plus CVA tenderness and signs of a UTI with leukocyte esterase and nitrites. Those patients are going to most likely have that ascending infection, pyelonephritis. Now, the USMLE and NBME love to go for what's the mechanism behind pyelonephritis, the infection of your kidney. And that is going to be usually vesico-ureteral reflux from the bladder. It's refluxing into the ureters and then up into the kidney. Now, how do they present a kidney stone? Well, yes, they're going to have flank pain. Likely patients with kidney stones are going to be afebrile. So that's how you tease it out uh, between pyelonephritis. And usually with the kidney stone, they will put something like this. They'll say the urine analysis shows three plus blood. And what that means is that the stone is actually shearing the blood vessels in the ureter and not only causing you flank pain, but giving you that microscopic hematuria. Periumbilical pain, you're going to be thinking about the early appendicitis before it migrates down to the right lower quadrant. And this is where you all are going to be all stars. Ready? When you think about suprapubic pain, yeah, yeah, yeah. Think about the bladder and the fact that you could have a simple UTI. But also think about the reproductive organs. Ladies and gentlemen, anybody in your test questions who has a high risk factor in terms of sexual activity or recurrent um, uh, sexually transmitted infections, pelvic inflammatory disease, testicular torsion, anytime you have that lower abdominal pain, you got to be thinking about the reproductive organs. In the female, you're going to be thinking about the ovaries. In the male, you're going to be thinking about the testes. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's go ahead and answer this question. An 18-year-old male complains of nausea and lower abdominal pain. He has no vomiting or diarrhea. He has been afebrile and denies sexual activity. Urine analysis is negative for leukocyte esterase and nitrites. Ultrasound with Doppler show reduced flow to the testes. Which of the following most likely describes the pathophysiology in this patient? A inflammation of the epididymis due to gram-negative dipocoxi, B, colonization of the urethra due to gram-negative rods, C, spermatic cord twisting with vascular peduncle compromise, and D, neoplastic change to the testes with increased AFP. What do you all think? And you're absolutely correct if you put C, that is going to be classic for testicular torsion. Now, I'm going to really hone in on this, and this is in my test-taking strategies course, as well as if you are uh, preparing with me on an individual basis, I'm a big fan of highlighting anytime the US Emily puts no, negative, and normal. Anytime they put no, negative, or normal, you want to integrate that in your mind as a pertinent negative. What that means is that the USMLE is saying, all right, this is not going to be gastroenteritis or some sort of uh, some sort of appendicitis. It's negative for leukocyte esterase. They're like, this is a pertinent negative. I don't want you to be thinking about a UTI. So anytime you see no negative and normal, you should say they're putting that in there to sway me away from that diagnosis. And I should be focusing on another diagnosis. Always hone in on that. And that's a really good test taking strategy. All right, so we talked about testicular torsion, and now let's go into a little bit of anatomy of the spermatic cord. Now, the way that I like to remember this is that the spermatic cord is going to have three things, three arteries, three nerves, and three other things. That's how I remember the overall uh, categorization. So what are the three arteries in the spermatic cord? Well, you're going to have the testicular artery, the artery to the ductus deferens, as well as the cremasteric artery. What are the three nerves in the spermatic cord? Well, that's going to be the genital branch of the genitofemoral nerve, as well as the cremasteric nerve. And then the three other things that you have to integrate is the ductus deferens, the panpiniform plexus, as well as general lymphatics. Three arteries, three nerves, three other things. And why did I highlight this area in blue? Well, 
First off, recognize the genital branch of the genital femoral nerve is the primary nerve that innervates the cremasteric reflex, which is basically your testes moving upon stroking the inner thigh. That is probably the most important physical exam finding when you're suspecting somebody with testicular torsion. So they may ask you, the patient has an absent cremasteric reflux, what's the primary nerve which may be compromised? And that could be the genital branch of the genital femoral nerve. Remember, the other test question that they can ask is going to be the relation to the dilation of the pan-piniform plexus. And what's that pathology known as? That's a varicocele. A varicocele is the dilatation of the pan piniform plexus. Very high yield for you to integrate. All right, let's go ahead and go into this question. A 57 year old male presents with the primary complaint of erectile dysfunction. After proper evaluation, the patient is started on daily administration of sildenafil. This medication causes accumulation of which of the following intracellular mediators? And you're absolutely correct. You're thinking about cyclic GMP. Now let's go ahead and integrate. Sildenafil is a phosphodiesterase inhibitor and it upregulates the amount of cyclic GMP. But where do we also use sildenafil? Well, guess what? That's in the respiratory pharmacology section in your first aid 2021. And you're absolutely correct because we use sildenafil in pulmonary hypertension as well. So as you note right here, sildenafil is going to be a phosphodiesterase five inhibitor, and you're going to get increased amounts of cyclic GMP. That's going to cause vasodilation in the pulmonary vasculature and relieve the increased right ventricular afterload that you may see in pulmonary hypertension. Now, another high yield tie-in here is biochemistry. And that is that arginine is the precursor for nitric oxide. What is going to be endothelin antagonist? That's going to be bosentin. And you're going to have prost drugs help you with the prostacyclin agonism. So when you're thinking about pulmonary hypertension, you're going to think of endothelin, nitric oxide, and prostacyclin pathway. The next portion of this is going to be hernias. And what we're going to do is go through hernias in an active recall manner. What I basically did was I made vignettes for each of the different types of hernias. And I've put the vignettes into the bare bone form. And then we'll just go through the high yield points that are related to it. Active recall, active recall, here we go. A neonate with respiratory failure and has air noted in the left lower lung field. What kind of hernia is this? Well, this is a congenital diaphragmatic hernia in which there's a defect in the pleuroperitoneal membrane, which forms the diaphragm. And if you have that, the gastric contents on the left side can actually go up. And that's why you have the air or sometimes bowel sounds in the lungs. What's important is that this is most likely going to be on the left side and not the right side, because on the right side, you have protection of the liver. Now, a high-speed motor vehicle accident can also give you a diaphragmatic hernia. So that's why I said watch for trauma after a motor vehicle collision. All right, here's another one. An infant who is noted to have a bulge in the scrotal region. It is compressible, and I'm going to highlight this pertinent negative, no transillumination to light. So I'm saying, hey, guys, don't think about a hydrocele. What is the likely diagnosis here? Well, if it's going to be a bulge in the scrotal region, you're going to be thinking about an indirect inguinal hernia. So indirect inguinal hernia goes into the scrotum. And it's going to actually go into the internal inguinal ring. Now, what you're going to need to parallel is the fact that indirect inguinal hernias are going to be lateral to the inferior epigastric vessels. And I like to use the mnemonic lie such that I know that lateral to the inferior epigastric arteries is going to be the indirect hernia. 
Subsequently, you need to characterize that or parallel that to an adult who has an abdominal bulge worse with coughing. On exam, this is reducible. That means it compresses in and out. What's the likely diagnosis? Well, this is the direct inguinal hernia. And the key anatomical landmark is not the internal inguinal ring, but the external inguinal ring. And so when indirect goes into the scrotum, direct goes directly into the abdomen. Direct goes directly into the abdomen. And I use the mnemonic MD to help me remember that it is medial, direct hernias are medial to the inferior epigastric vessels. Now the inferior epigastric vessels, guess what? Is a branch of the external iliac, which comes from the common iliac, and that comes from the aorta. And th this is a nice little anatomy integration. I'm just kind of taking you through this pathway. And most importantly, I'm focusing on compare and contrast. And that's something that you should really burn into your mind as you're studying is anytime the, the concepts are like, hey, this concept differs from this concept, please know the differences and the similarities. Finally, let's go through this last vignette. A female who presents with a mass in the groin region, and she is in excruciating pain. The mass is noted to be not compressible. And that's really scary that she's in excruciating pain. She has a groin mass and it's not getting reduced. <gasps> this is going to be your femoral hernia. Femoral hernia in females, and it is going to have a high likelihood of having what we call incarceration. And what you need to know is that when you have bowel incarceration, that's obviously a surgical emergency and that cuts off the vascular supply and that could give you necrosis of the bowel. Femoral hernias in females and they are going to be below the inguinal ligament. All right, shifting gears into the congenital pathologies. We're gonna be talking about Meckel's diverticulum. When we think about the vignette for Meckel's diverticulum, it is the following. A three-year-old presents with abdominal pain and rectal bleeding. Typically, this rectal bleeding, by the way, is non-painful. Please know that. A technesium-99 scan, which is a nuclear medicine scan, reveals the presence of gastric tissue two feet from the ileocecal valve. What is the most likely mechanism behind this pathology? Well, in Meckel's diverticulum, this is going to be a failure of the vitellin duct to obliterate completely. And in particular, you are going to get a connection and an outpouching, what we call a true diverticulum. And that tr true diverticulum is going to have a anatomic correlation being about two feet away from the ileocecal valve, as well as the fact that it'll have gastric and pancreatic tissue. And that is essentially known as ectopic tissue. What's high yield for you to know is that a Meckel's diverticulum is going to have the layers histologically being outpouched. So essentially, what are those layers? Mucosa, submucosa, muscularis, serosa, all of them are going to be outpouched. And that is the key for a true diverticulum. I want to compare and contrast true versus false diverticulum. We said that the Meckel's diverticulum is a true diverticulum in which you have the mucosa, submucosa, muscularis, and serosa all outpouched. The appendix has a similar type of organization. A false diverticula is usually due to pulsion or traction. So that's why it's only the top two layers. What are going to be examples of false diverticula? Well, Zenker's diverticulum. Zenker's diverticulum is typically going to be in the upper pharyngeal uh, region. And so the mechanism the USMLE loves to go for, and that is cricopharyngeal dysfunction. And because you have a little bit of an outpouching there, food can get stuck. And that's why in test questions, they talk about halitosis. What's also important is that if you have an old person who presents with lower GI bleeding and they have a history of constipation, think about diverticulosis because diverticulosis is related to pulsion due to the constipation, and that could cause you to have GI bleeding. Another embryology integration is the following. And the way that I like to think of it is the following. 
Ready? A persistent vitellin fistula, or what we call a persistent vitellin duct, is going to be in a patient who poops from the belly button. So if they come having on your test questions, a baby is having meconium stain discharge from the umbilicus, you're going to be thinking of a persistent vitellin fistula. And if you hear the word omphalomesenteric, that's the same thing as the vitellin duct. If you have a patient on your exam that is, they're saying is peeing from the umbilicus, that's the pathology known as patent urachus. And remember that the allantois is going to connect the urinary system in the baby to the actual yolk sac cavity. And so what you need to know is that the allantois becomes the urachus. And if that doesn't necessarily close, you are going to end up having pee coming out from the belly button. So poop from the belly button, persistent vitellin fistula, pee from the belly button, patent urachus. There's not too much uh, uh, there's, uh, not too much like kind of depth. You need to know that, uh, concept in. Okay. All right. Next one is going to be congenital pathologies. And we're going to be talking about Hirschsprung disease. Now, when I think about Hirschsprung disease, guys, this is a another test taking strategy. And that is the failure to pass stool within the first 48 hours. And that's called failure to pass that first stool, which is known as meconium. There are two pathologies that you need to know when you can't pass meconium. The first one is if you have somebody who has a small colon, failure to thrive, recurrent infections, and they may or may not have steatorrhea. And that is meconium ileus related to cystic fibrosis. Remember that the meconium is gonna be so, so thick that it is going to actually obstruct the terminal ileum. Contrast that with somebody who has a big colon on your imaging. And th they say the baby hasn't pooped for the first 48 hours of life, but the baby also has hypotonia and signs and symptoms of Down syndrome. Remember that Hirschsprung disease is related to Down syndrome and Hirschsprung disease, you don't have that myenteric plexus. Remember there's histologically something known as the hour box myenteric plexus, which controls the inner circular and the outer longitudinal muscles of the GI tract. So the next portion of this is to just look at these pathologies on imaging. Meconium ileus, you see a microcolon. See how small this colon is? Whereas in Hirschsprung's, you see a dilated and distended colon. And in Hirschsprung's disease, we get a rectal biopsy and we get that rectal suction biopsy and it is going to show us, hey, there are no Auerbach myenteric plexus cells and that failure of neural migration is the mechanism behind the Hirschsprung's disease. All right, we're almost done with our GI section. Let's go ahead and talk about Crohn's versus ulcerative colitis. So obviously you know that Crohn's and ulcerative colitis is going to be under the umbrella term IBD. Now remember, inflammatory bowel disease is different than irritable bowel syndrome. Irritable bowel syndrome is when you get changes in your bowel, but you're not getting this high amount of inflammation. So I know they sound similar, but I want you to kind of uh, keep them straight in your mind. Let's go for this question. 26 year old female, pay attention with me, presents with abdominal pain and diarrhea. She has been having fatty stools chronically and barium enema shows narrowing at the level of the jejunum patient undergoes EGD, what will be the histological findings? So as this affects the whole gut too, you're going to be thinking about Crohn's disease and in particular, a full thickness inflammation and non-caseating granulomas. These are two histological features of Crohn's disease. And as you note, there's inflammation starting from the mouth, ending at the anus, Crohn's disease affects the whole gut tube, whereas as we will see in ulcerative colitis, it ulcerative colitis usually is limited to the colon. In Crohn's disease, there is an immunological mechanism that is important for us to know. And that is the fact that as the antigens are presented to the macrophages, they're going to start secreting IL-12. And that IL-12 
induces, very important, the CD4 T cells to go into a Th1 phenotype. IL-12 induces the Th1 phenotype. As a result, these now nearly differentiated Th1 cells secrete IL-2, which stimulates T cells, as well as interferon gamma. And interferon gamma activates the macrophages into epithelioid histiocytes. And remember that the classic feature for your um, uh, granulomas is the presence of epithelioid histiocytes, which are just activated macrophages. Now, in turn, the macrophages secrete TNF-alpha, and that TNF-alpha gives you that intestinal injury and that transmural inflammation that I just talked about. Remember that TNF-alpha is going to be a cytokine that is going to maintain a granuloma. And we think about that not only in Crohn's disease, but also in things like tuberculosis. So just to tie in some pharmacology here, when we have high amount of TNF alpha, especially we see this in IBD, we can use things like infliximab, etanercept to actually inhibit the amount of TNF alpha. If you inhibit TNF alpha, you get less amount of intestinal cell injury. But what's important is to do a PPD test, i.e. a tuberculosis test prior to starting patients on a TNF alpha inhibitor because of the chance that tuberculosis could be reactivated. What's the dermatological association with Crohn's disease? And that is going to be pyoderma gangrenosum. We are going to see this in this slide. It is going to be a really gnarly looking ulcerative rash. What I now want to do is integrate many of the high yield granulomas you will see on your USMLE. The top one represents a non-caseting granulomas. As you see, some cells are still within that, um, uh, in the granuloma center. And the bottom of one represents a caseating granuloma in which there's a little bit more necrosis in that central core of the granuloma. Now, infectious etiologies related to granulomas, you got to know casein and granulomas in tuberculosis. Histoplasmosis is another one. Cryptococcus. Bartonella, which is related to cat scratch disease. They'll say stellate-shaped granulomas. That's an NBME question. Listeria is going to cause a pathology known as granuloma, uh, granuloma infant septicum. Inflammatory etiologies that are important for granulomas, sarcoidosis. Remember, that's usually African-American female with a dry cough, bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy. They may have erythema nodosum, which is a shin rash, and the non caseating granulomas. Crohn's disease, which got us into this mess. Granulomatosis with polyangitis, that's a vasculitis. We previously called it Wegner's disease as well as churg strouch which we now call eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis, that also has granulomas. What are other miscellaneous ones? Borreliosis. Remember, borreliosis mimics sarcoidosis. That's an exam question, as well as chronic granulomatous disease. And that's going to be a child who gets recurrent infections due to a lack of having NADPH oxidase, and you're not having enough free radical production. All right, so let's go ahead and contrast the Crohn's disease, which this vignette, a patient presents with blood-tinged diarrhea. He states that he has abdominal pain and mucousy diarrhea. He has flexible sigmoidoscopy showing a friable mucosal pseudopolyps. What will be the histological finding behind this diagnosis? So just so that I know you're paying attention, what do you think the likely diagnosis is here? What's the likely diagnosis? Go ahead and put that in the chat. Stick with me here. We have a lot of people saying ulcerative colitis, and you're absolutely correct. That blood tinge diarrhea, the high amount of inflammation. And remember that you see crypt abscesses and mucosal, not transmural, but just the mucosal inflammation in ulcerative colitis. So ulcerative colitis, if this same patient now presents a little bit sicker, please note this vignette, now presents with profuse bloody diarrhea, severe abdominal pain and bloating, as well as shock, this is going to be really scary because this inflammation now has progressed 
and gut bacteria may have translocated in the, into, the actual, uh, into the actual blood. And so you're going to be thinking about toxic megacolon. This is a severe complication of ulcerative colitis. Where else can you see toxic megacolon? C. diff infections, as well as you can see toxic megacolon related to trypanosoma cruzi infections. So again, I'm just trying to help you integrate. Stick with me here. We're almost done, but please note these high yield vignettes. So Crohn's disease is going to be mouth to anus inflammation, whereas ulcerative colitis limited to the actual colon. You see transmural information in Crohn's. You see crypt abscesses in ulcerative colitis. Typically in Crohn's disease, because you have the transmural inflammation, you're going to have the strictures described in your uh, questions as well as the fistulas. Whereas in ulcerative colitis, you're going to get a loss of the haustra, which are normal histological characteristics of the large intestine. You want to associate the oral lesions, the aptus ulcers with Crohn's disease and associate in ulcerative colitis, primary sclerosing cholangitis. Remember, this is going to be a gallbladder pathology in which you get onion skinning of the intra and extra hepatic ducts, very high yield for you to know. And there's an autoimmune association with P. anca. Ulcerative colitis patients can have a higher risk for colon cancer. So I remember UC can give you CC, colonic carcinoma, UC can give you CC, and you can get that toxic megacolon, which we talked about. Both of these patients can have arthritis, and that's what we call it, HLA B27 type arthritis, and that is IBD associated arthritis. Erythema nodosum, as well as pyoderma gangrenosum can be seen in both. All right, guys, we are wrapping up covering next bile acid metabolism. Here's a biochemistry integration for you. Which of the following best describes the pathophysiology of this patient's symptoms? A 40-year-old female presents with episodic right shoulder pain. She says that her pain is worse after meals. No trauma is noted. Her BMI is 35. Exam shows tenderness to palpation in the right upper quadrant. What do you think is the likely mechanism here? All right, and you're absolutely correct when you say CCK stimulation of gallbladder contraction. You must know that CCK contracts the gallbladder, that's normal GI physiology, also recognize that you get downstream sphincter of OD relaxation in normal physiology, CCK contracts the gallbladder, and then downstream you get normal sphincter of OD relaxation. And that's where the bile can then go into the gallbladder. So when I think of bile acid metabolism, guys, what I like to do is I like to take biochemistry and learn it like this. Who, what, when, where, why? Who, what, when, where, why? So let's start with this. Why does our body need bile acid Pathway. Again, I'm giving you the big picture. Well, it's to actually break down fats that we eat in the small intestine. Where does this process occur? Bile acid metabolism occurs in the hepatocyte. The bile is then stored in the gallbladder and released in the duodenum. What is the rate limiting enzyme? The rate limiting enzyme is 7 alpha hydroxylase. You probably have to know that fact. When does this process occur? This process occurs primarily when we have rest and digest, increased parasympathetic activity. And let's just go through the process in a nutshell. Again, I want to summarize this and give you the highest amount of value I can. And that is first, we make primary bile acids. Primary bile acids are like cholic acid, quinodeoxycholic acid. Those are then conjugated to glycine and taurine. And an acid plus glycine and taurine hooked up onto them is known as a bile salt. Bile salts are part of mysels. And thus, the mysels helps us bring in the fat into the intestinal brush border area. And then finally, these bile salts are going to then be reabsorbed in the terminal ileum. And that's what it's called, why it's called enterohepatic circulation. You start in the terminal ileum and all those bile salts are then taken back to the liver. So the process of fat reabsorption can happen again. Terminal ileal disease can cause you to have 
B12 deficiency in your exam questions, as well as bile acid or bile salt, uh, uh, bile salts not being able to be reabsorbed. And that's so important for you to recognize because these patients who don't have good bile salts because of their terminal ileal disease, those patients can have steatorrhea because you can't reabsorb all of the fats. So remember, in the duodenum, we reabsorb iron. In the jejunum, we reabsorb folate. And in the terminal ileum, we reabsorb B12 as well as bile salts. The next area of hepatology, we have two more concepts, and that is going to be hepatitis B. Hepatitis B, I want to give you just some test-taking strategies because honestly, USMLA questions are going to want you to integrate the serologies. So the way that I like to think about it is the following. Basic principles. When you have hepatitis B antigen and E antigen, surface and E antigen, please pay attention here. You are ha having an active hepatitis B infection. The next principle is that as soon as your body sees the surface antigen in your bloodstream, the body says, oh shit, let me go ahead and do the immune response. And so then you quickly develop hepatitis B core IgM. And so when you quickly develop that, the hepatitis B surface antigen serology will go down. And that's what we call the window period because your body just saw the surface antigen and it's like, I got to make some immune re reaction to that and suppress the surface antigen. Once you have hepatitis B surface antibody, keep paying attention to this. You have been resolved with the infection or you have been vaccinated. So let's go into a little bit of active recall and understand that in your USMLA questions, hepatitis B usually is STD or parenterally bloodstream uh, transmitted. So in acute hepatitis, remember, anytime you have hepatitis B surface antigen and E antigen, you have active, active disease. And you're going to have hepatitis B core IgM B positive. Why? Because you have surface antigen and surface antigen is then going to trigger the immune response. What about this scenario? Say that you just have anti-hep B core IgM. And I apologize, this may be a uh, error. I wanted to say, say that you have not this, but let's just say this here, that you have anti-hep B surface antibody. If you have anti-hep B surface antibody, just the surface antibody, not this error here, you're going to be vaccinated. And that's why I put this in here because they love to test you. That vaccination gives you anti hepatitis B surface antibody. You've got to understand that. That vaccination gives you anti-hepatitis B surface antibody. And usually that's the only one that is positive. So I actually uh, apologize for any error there. The last concept we will be going through before a live Q&A is vesicular steatosis. Let's go ahead and go through a test question here. Which of the following is the most likely pathology on liver biopsy? 37-year-old woman presents for evaluation of abnormal liver chemistries. She has a long-standing history of obesity and dyslipidemia. She takes no other medications and has a negative social history. On exam, her liver span is slightly enlarged and she has no splenomegaly. Several sets of liver enzymes have shown transaminases two to three times normal. So they're building this picture that, man, she has high transaminases. Bilirubin and alkaline phos, again, I have to stress this, are normal. So this is not a biliary pathology. Hepatitis B surface antigen and hepatitis B surface antibody are normal. Again, a pertinent negative. And serum iron and total iron binding capacity are also normal. So it's not hemochromatosis. Which of the following are you going to see? Why don't you go ahead and put this into the chat? I want everybody to continue to pay attention here. What do you think? 
And the answer is this macro vesicular fatty liver. Remember that this is very characteristic of your non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. This is typically a pathology related to somebody who has a metabolic syndrome, and that's high yield for you to know. Microvesicular fatty liver, think about that with Ray syndrome, in which your exam questions talk about aspirin ingestion. So what is the pathophysiology? Typically, you are going to have insulin resistance. And what that insulin resistance is going to be related to is underlying metabolic syndrome. When you have a high amount of insulin resistance, you are going to have more fatty acid uptake, especially in the liver. And when you have that, you get NAFLD, which is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Now with this excess amount of metabolic syndrome, you're going to obviously have more free radicals and more free radicals can cause the hepatocyte to actually die. And so that hepatocyte death causes inflammation. And that's where you then progress to NASH, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. And if you have inflammation for a long period of time, your stellate cells within the, the actual liver start secreting TGF beta and you can progress to fibrosis and cirrhosis. So the key is the fact that patients in US only questions are gonna have metabolic syndrome that then causes them to build up fat within their liver giving you the fatty liver disease and subsequent, if there's cell injury and death, there's going to be hepatitis. So metabolic syndrome in your exam questions, clues are going to be high abdominal circumference, dyslipidemia, high blood pressure, and that insulin resistance, which we talked about. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the end of today's session. I really thank you for paying attention and please just give me two minutes of your time if you love the way that you prepared today, guys, I really would encourage you to check out my test taking strategy and rapid review course. This gives you the foundational skills on how to approach questions and how to actually go through high yield material in an active recall way. So many students have already benefited from this. It covers seven essential concepts from test taking strategy all the way to 100 concepts in gross anatomy. So definitely check it out on my website. I also have a study schedule, which if you want to get productive with me and learn how to balance all of the different resources, I have that on my website as well. And most importantly, I have free resources, First Aid Outline, which covers how to integrate biochemistry as well as the microbiology with every single organ system, and my Golian style course, which is a free set of lectures that basically goes through not only NBME top concepts, but some other active recall topics relative to each organ system. Before you leave today, guys, just go ahead and type in to the chat box one thing that you learned one takeaway, fact, test taking skills, something that you learned, go ahead and just type it in the chat. Be participative with me. Don't just log off. I want you to definitely just interact with me before you leave. Awesome pharmacology learning strategy. Excellent. Look at everybody. And this is a great time to not only type in what you learned, but please ask me any questions I am so, so happy that you all tuned in and uh, thank you again. I'm going to stick around for questions.